welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. It's been another week when ESCOM and electricity have grabbed the headlines. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss some of the latest developments. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. The biggest news of this week in the electricity sector is undoubtedly the 59 billion rand support package for ESCOM. Yes, we knew this was coming because the President announced it in his second State of the Nation that um, after the budget where it was indicated that uh, Eskom would get 23 billion rand a year over a three-year period, um, but there were indications immediately that it could be extended to 10. It was confirmed by President Cyril Ramaphosa that this 23 billion rand it, it would indeed come through for a 10-year period and would be front-end front loaded. And we saw that with the uh, Special Appropriations Bill with 26 billion uh, dedicated for this financial year and another 33 billion coming for the following financial year. And we could, can expect uh, similar appropriations for Eskom into the future over this 10 year horizon uh, in nominal terms at 230 billion rand. So th this is a massive injection from the taxpayer ultimately into Eskom. It's going to mean that the National Treasury is going to have to raise more money on the bond market to pay for this, but ultimately to recoup, it, uh, recoup that uh, investment into injection into Eskom, um, we'll, we'll have to pay probably higher taxes in the end. And obviously it's going to have knock-on effects on the uh, budget balance, on the deficit, on the debt load, and uh, that's going to be the thing that uh, I suppose the ratings agency, especially the one that sustained our investment grade rating, Moody's, will be looking at um, you know, that sort of fiscal slippage, whether in light of that slippage, um, uh, um, uh, South Africa needs to be downgraded as a sovereign. There were also surprise developments at the IPP office. Yes, yeah, so uh, while there's this focus on Eskom and its lack of financial sustainability, um, and uh, I think what also became clear in terms of that sustainability is that these injections, these fiscal injections, these transfers, are, are going to be insufficient. So they're massive but insufficient uh, to get Eskom onto a sustainable path. So we're going to have to see what that means for the tariff. Uh, one of the ways to give relief on the supply side, because Eskom is now totally cash trapped, uh, is that it's going to have to come from the private sector and the RPPs. And that's one bright spot, I suppose, over the last uh, 10 years, is how the RPP office has been managed and has been able to bring in new investors into the uh, South African electricity system. And the shock news is that uh, the head of that, who's highly respected, Karin Breitenbach, um, has been sort of told to leave the office now. Her contract did expire in February, but the indication under the former uh, um, energy minister, Jeff Kadebe, was that he wanted Karin to say, stay and that her contract would be extended. We then saw this very convoluted uh, um, press statement from the DBSA trying to explain how she was past retirement age, they needed to ex advertise uh, for a new head of the RPP office, that they couldn't see eye to eye in terms of the extension of the contract. And there seems to be some unclarity as to whether she actually did get a contract extension to April next year. But be that as it may, it seems Karin Breitenbach has left. That does leave a void at the RPP office, which uh, both the DBSA and the DOE have said will be closed through an interim head, and then there will be a search for a permanent replacement. But the key here is that we need to, because of this cash-strapped nature of Eskom, they cannot build. And we know that we've got a gap on our supply side, and it's looming. We've already had load shedding this year. Um, we need to start building uh, additional uh, supply. And uh, it's going to be important that the uh, documents that come out for bid window 5 for the renewables and any other technology, especially gas to power, are what people call bankable. And that's where Karine was very, very strong. She was able to release, uh, ensure and oversee the release of documents that the, the market had an appetite for. And that's why we saw so many, uh, two, over 200 billion rands worth of investment in the renewables program alone, over 100 projects coming into South Africa. And uh, the concern here is, will the new head, hopefully the institutional capacity stays in place, but there's been a fairly long gap now between the last time we issued bid documents and the changes that, uh, that have already been signaled by government to what's going to be in, contained in those next round of bid documents, higher levels of localization, higher levels of South African ownership, higher levels of black ownership. 
how those are going to be accepted or you know responded to by the market. We can't afford to be in a situation where we're desperate for new supply and the bid documents that are released either on the renewable side or the gas to power side you know, on, are not uh, welcome by the market, uh, create no appetite for investors. I do think that we can navigate this, but it is a bit of a blow. There are renewed fears of a return to load shedding. Yes, as I say, you know, Eskom can't build, they, can't, they don't have uh, finances to build. There's been this massive gap. The last time we properly tended uh, was 2014-15 for um, IPPs. So we need to get back into the, the groove of procurement of uh, supply. We know that Eskom made it very clear that winter was probably going to be okay. Um, that the, you know, the, this is what happens in the cycle of things. Uh, Eskom, Eskom uh, maintains its plant, takes a lot of plant out for maintenance during the summer months. Uh, there's also those are the period of the wet periods for South Africa. That's where coal handling becomes tricky. So traditionally, we don't really load shed in winter. We did, we did at periods when things were really bad in, in around 2015. But generally, typically, we don't load shed in winter. We're now coming out of the winter phase, even though it's in probably the coldest period at the moment, and there is very high demand. But the plants are relatively stable during this period. It's going to be when we start taking the units down for maintenance that some of the issues are going to come to the fore again. Uh, well, that's the concern. Now, we don't have Eskom with new supply bec other than the Madupi and Kusila units, which are starting to come into commercial operation. But there, again, <laughs> you know, th when those units come into commercial, they don't operate at their 800 megawatt nameplate. They're offer operating well below that. There's a number of teething problems, we hope that it's only teething problems and not fundamental problems with getting them up to that nameplate. So the, the assumptions in the integrated resource plan of Madupi and Kusile closing the gap, I think are quite a little bit uh, optimistic. And then obviously the, the integrated resource plan also, that the draft one that has still hasn't been approved, also assumes that um, there's going to be uh, a fairly high energy availability factor from the, the coal fleet. Uh, initially it was around 80%, we're now in the sort of 71, 75% range in the latest draft of the integrated resource plan, but that's not where the fleet is operating. The fleet is operating more in the 60% to 70% range. So we're well below that. So th on the supply side, there's a, there's a potential for a gap. Now we haven't had the procurement programs in the, uh, in the other renewables or the gas to power space, and those all have lead times. So I think the concern uh, is that uh, while there's so many balls in the air, there's uh, Eskom sustainability, there's the price path that probably doesn't close the gap even after the fiscal injections that needs to be dealt with. There's court cases coming up around the nurses' um, determinations uh, on Eskom's RCA as well as the, the one-year application for price increases for 2018-2019. There's those balls in the air. But Fundamentally, there's deep concern as well about whether there's going to be enough electricity in the system, not only to support existing in the industrial and residential use, but to also help facilitate any growth and investment. And uh, we still have a policy gap in terms of the larger scale embedded generation uh, plants, where you can at the moment really only go up to the 10 megawatt level. Now, when you look at the mining companies uh, that are looking at power generation, uh, solar, for instance, they're not talking about uh, 10 generation, pl t 10 megawatt plants. They're talking about plants above 25 megawatts. Anglo Platinum's talking about a 75 megawatt plant. So there's a policy lacuna there that needs to be filled and it needs to be filled urgency, urgently. And just the clock is now ticking, not just on the Eskom financial sustainability and the technical operational um, functionality of its coal fleet, but also getting to close, uh, the clock is ticking in terms of the supply gap, the gap that could emerge and can only be closed through RPPs in the private sector, both at a small scale and gener uh, embedded generation level, which is an important place and the, probably the quickest win. It's off government balance sheet. The risk is taken by the, uh, the user of the electricity. And then we also have to have the larger scale uh, getting going through the RPP programs. So. I think the urgency, I don't know, it seems there's an understanding of the urgency at the Eskom level, but there's an electricity supply industry urgency that seems to be being missed at the moment. 
and we need to get our heads around it very, very quickly. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily Email Newsletter.